I'm just sick and tired of the violence that's happening in this province, and uh, we need the federal government to change the criminal code once and for all and stop being a bunch of bleeding hearts there because people are fed up with this crime here. They're absolutely done with it. Even Ontario Premier Doug Ford says the federal government needs to fix the criminal code in order to keep Canadians safe. But what changes actually need to be made? Let's have a look. Welcome back to the channel. So today we're going to be talking about self-defense laws and home protection. This is a topic which has slowly been creeping to the forefront of political discourse over the last several years here in Canada. But about five or six months ago, it reached a boiling point when York Regional Police said this. To prevent the possibility of being attacked in your home, leave your fobs at your front door. Because they're breaking into your home to steal your car. They're, they don't want anything else. A lot of them that they're arresting have guns on them. And they're not toy guns, they're real guns. They're loaded. Many Canadians already believed something needed to change long before this statement by York Regional Police. But for those who really didn't understand the problem prior to that, it was really quite the eye-opener. Their instructions were rather clear. The official recommendation from the police was to make yourself a victim. You aren't able to protect yourself from armed and dangerous men, and the police won't be there to do it for you. And therefore, you should make it as easy as possible for criminals to steal your vehicles, otherwise these dangerous people may harm you, or worse. Of course, this sparked outrage from all across the political spectrum here in Canada, and it even made international news in some places. What you're about to watch is the very reason why you don't give up your 2A rights and depend on the government to keep you safe, because when that time comes for them to keep you safe, this is what they tell you. If you live in Toronto, just, just leave your car keys by the front door. In fact, probably don't even bother locking your front door. So, in fact, but, but, why not just leave the whole place unlocked? Put your jewelry out on the front <laughs> porch, maybe your TV out of there, because you don't want to get hurt. All the thieves want is your car and your stuff and whatever else. This is where we are. As a result, many politicians across the country have promised reform designed at keeping Canadians safe. But ultimately, the reform that is needed lies in the hands of the federal government. It's certainly no secret that the surge in violent crime scene in Canada since 2015 is undoubtedly the fault of Trudeau and the Liberal government. Their soft on crime policies are directly responsible for the massive spike in violent crime since Trudeau took office. Trudeau has tried to blame lawful firearms owners for this, but every reputable agency and police department in the country has repeatedly and publicly stated, for years now, that we are not the problem. I want to take this opportunity to, to provide you with some of the data so you understand what's taking place within the region and the root cause of gun violence. In 2024, the region has seen a 92% increase in shootings. And equally troubling, since 2019, over a five-year period, we've seen a 400% increase in carjackings. Illegal handguns have become all too easy to access with limited consequences for criminals. And almost all of the guns being used in these crimes are illegal handguns, many of which are being smuggled across the border from the U.S. This surge in gun violence can be attributed to organized crime rings who are obtaining any and using illegal handguns to commit a number of offenses. And now we see even longtime ally Doug Ford changing his tune now that he knows Trudeau is on his way out. When asked about self-defense in Canada, this response from Ford really highlights the glaring problem facing Canadians, which our politicians are placing onto our shoulders. When we catch these people, these bad people, these bad guys, because they're 99.9% .9 are guys, you know, we need to throw them in jail. We don't need to throw them in jail uh, for a day or two days. We need to send them to jail for years and keep them behind bars. Because if there's a deterrent, people are going to think twice about breaking in. You know, I, I use this example, many doors get kicked in, guns are put to people's heads, terrifying experience, and guess what? The, the guy's back out on, on the streets to repeat the same crime he did the night before because we have a, a weak system, weak criminal system. You know, you try to do this down in the States, two things are going to happen. You're getting caught and you're going to jail for years, or the homeowner's going to shoot you, one of the two. And uh, I'd rather uh, keep guns out of... Out of uh, communities. Ford's plan, and the plan of most politicians I think, seeks to change the criminal justice system. Criminal law reform and locking up serious offenders for appropriate durations is certainly something I can get behind, and most everyone in Canada can get behind. But that's not the only problem that Canadians are exposed to. 
This approach would definitely change the current trajectory of our crime graphs, and it would reduce the violent crime problem as a whole in a fairly significant way if the proper policies were implemented correctly. However, the other half of the problem remains completely unaddressed. For those who didn't hear it or maybe glossed over it, Ford is outright against self-defense for Canadians. He does not believe that Canadians should have the means of protecting themselves from dangerous individuals. He knowingly points out that in the States, the government will stop criminals, and when the government inevitably fails at that duty, citizens will be able to stop them criminals themselves since they are armed. He then openly says he does not want that in our communities. <laughs> what a horrible thing that would be. People being able to defend themselves when no one else will. What a miserable fate for our society to endure. Now most people already know this, but this just further solidifies that Ford is conservative in name only. And Ford aside, most politicians in Canada also seem to think this is the way it should be. And even most Canadians seem to be on board with that sentiment. Or at least they were until about five or six months ago when York Regional Police said what they did. But lately that attitude has started to shift rather significantly. Canadians are starting to realize that some politicians aren't even interested in providing deterrence. And even for the ones that are, deterrence isn't protection. So what's the difference between deterrence and protection? Well, perhaps the most obvious manifestation of this is home security systems. It's a blatant misnomer. Your house isn't any more secure by putting up lights and cameras. That isn't security, that's just surveillance. Lights, cameras, and even alarms are mostly meaningless unless they're connected to someone or something both willing and able to use force to repel intruders. Deterrents like surveillance are certainly useful at reducing the probability that you will be harmed, which is why they work at scale. But they do not truly offer protection or security of any kind for the individual, since committed and determined criminals can simply choose to ignore them if they want to. Likewise, enhancements to the criminal law in Canada are merely a deterrent and not a protection. To understand this, we need to take a look at exactly what the criminal law aims to do. According to the Public Prosecution Service of Canada, these are the federal crown prosecutors responsible for prosecuting federal statutes here in Canada, the purpose of criminal law is as follows. So they say, criminal law is premised on the belief that some acts ought to be prevented, and that the criminal process is the best way to prevent them. The criminal law achieves this objective through punishment. So they say the objective of criminal law is protection, but then they also say that the way to achieve that objective is through punishment. This clearly highlights the fatal flaw of relying solely on the courts or the justice system to protect people in Canada. Prevention through punishment is not a prevention, it is a deterrent. It explicitly does not prevent anyone from doing anything, nor does it even attempt to. It merely says that you will be punished if you choose to misbehave. And for what it's worth, I actually have no issue with this. In a free society, that's how the criminal law ought to work. Frankly, it's the only way it can work. The only alternative would be to punish people before they have done anything wrong. But if we start going down that route, then we aren't free anymore. So I've got no issue with any of that. However, there is one massive and glaring problem with this. Punishing people for doing bad things means that they did, in fact, do those bad things. It means that somebody did actually get hurt. From a societal perspective, it's both reasonable and likely to suppose that appropriate punishments would help reduce the number of future incidents. But from the individual's perspective, it's already too late. As unfortunate as it is, this is actually our criminal law working as intended. Our federal crown prosecutors have this to say. The essence of criminal law is its public nature. A crime is not a wrong against the actual person harmed, if there is one, but a wrong against the community as a whole. So the intended purpose of criminal law is to protect society, not actually to protect people. Weird as it sounds, those aren't really the same thing in this context. All of this is to say that the fundamental prerequisite of a functioning criminal justice system in a free society is sacrificial lambs. So while politicians like Ford are absolutely correct to say that the enhancements to the criminal code will help Canadians at large, he is utterly wrong to suggest that people do not also need the ability to protect themselves since these measures will do it for them. Because these measures never can and never will protect individuals. And fact of the matter is, they're not even designed to. And this is where the other half of the argument comes in. Self-defense. Self-defense should exist to fill the gaps created by the sacrificial lamb requirement of criminal law. And I say should, because at the moment, our laws are too restricted to allow this to happen effectively. Now you might say we have self-defense laws in Canada, and therefore it's an extension of criminal law, but it's wrong to think of self-defense as part of criminal law exactly. 
Not only is it a right outlined in the Charter, thereby superseding mere criminal law, but it's a basic right of all living things. Survival is the natural order of the world. So for any politician, judge, or otherwise, to say that you should or should not have any particular level or ability of protection for yourself is a complete violation of your natural right to exist. Also, the wording of self-defense laws, which we'll get into in a minute here, indicate that it's not something that they're allowing you to do per se, but rather it's something that they aren't actually allowed to even prosecute you for. But with all that in mind, it's worth saying that Canada's current self-defense laws are actually not entirely terrible in their current form. Contrary to popular belief, they do actually afford people with more than a minimal amount of legally available options. I think it's fair to say that they don't go far enough, but they are designed with some of the right ideas in mind. Where a lot of people go wrong is they're usually referring to the older version of self-defense laws in Canada. Oftentimes you will hear people say that we're not allowed to do anything, or that we have a duty to retreat, or stuff like that. Some of that information is outdated and other bits are just inaccurate. So let's start off with a quick recap of how things used to be, and then we'll get to how they are, and then some ideas of how I think they should be. So it used to be that self-defense laws allowed you to use no more force than necessary to protect yourself from unprovoked harm. If it was necessary to use significant or lethal force, then you also had to prove that you had no other options available to you in the circumstances. In Canada, you've never had a duty to retreat from within your own home. In the case of Crown v. Ford, paragraphs 53 to 56, they clearly demonstrate precedent going as far back as even the 60s, and a common law tradition predating even that, which explained that Canada has a long history of castle doctrine, which does not require an individual to retreat from the home, and implies that even outside of the home, it was merely a consideration of the ability to retreat, not necessarily an absolute requirement to do so. The only instance where you truly did have a duty to retreat comes from when you were the aggressor in the situation. So if you picked a fight with somebody without the intention of using significant or lethal force, and if during that fight your opponent responded with significant or lethal force, then you had a legal duty to retreat from that situation before you could respond in kind. Which honestly kind of makes sense. You shouldn't be able to attack or provoke someone into a fight and then claim self-defense if it goes sideways. The property defense laws were particularly insane back then. Like, you were technically allowed to stop people from stealing your property, but you weren't allowed to hurt them in the process. And I, I don't mean hurt them with significant or lethal force. I mean you were responsible for any and every boo-boo they incurred if you attempted to apprehend them. Even something as simple as pinning a would-be thief to the ground used to carry pretty significant criminal liability. So your only realistic option in order to stop them was you had to physically touch your property. And if they attempted to take your property anyway, then they would be additionally charged with assault. And <laughs> that was about it. <laughs> so in effect, you were legally required to play a game of tag with a potentially armed and or dangerous criminal, and that you still had to wait for the police to sort it all out, if they ever did at all. <laughs> which is utter lunacy. And that all changed in 2012 when this guy changed our self-defense laws for the better. The primary change was that most of the thresholds went from permitting only what was absolutely necessary to now allowing what is reasonable. As much as this wasn't an overhaul of the core self-defense rules exactly, it was still a fairly significant improvement over the previous threshold. However, this change also made the rules more generalized, meaning they're more open to interpretation and sort of gray areas. The property defense laws have been significantly enhanced and are now about what you think they should be. You are no longer entirely prevented from harming them, and they now also explicitly cover protections for destruction of property, which the previous laws didn't address. Self-defense is pretty straightforward. You are permitted to protect yourself or others from force or the threat of force, provided that your actions are directed at the source of that force and that your actions are also reasonable in the circumstances. So our current property defense and self-defense laws essentially hinge around this definition, reasonable in the circumstances, but what does that mean? And this brings us really to the problem of our current self-defense laws. There are no hard and fast rules exactly for what constitutes reasonable self-defense in Canada. As problematic as the old rules were, the threshold for what was legal and what was not was more clearly and deliberately spelled out. The current structure of the laws is mostly the same, but the threshold is now open to a broader interpretation by the courts often a jury in instances like these. And the problem with juries is that they can be filled with people like this. This is a clip from a recent panel discussing self-defense in Canada, and Runkel did a video reviewing it in depth. If you haven't seen it yet, go check it out. But the panel was asked 
what you're supposed to do if someone attacks you with a knife. And this lady's response was rather startling to say the least. It's a, it's a complicated issue for sure. I think there are other lines of defense that we're not talking about right now, such as if you're on the subway and you're feeling insecure, you're somewhere and you're feeling strange, not just having your cell phone at the ready, but making the call, saying, yes, I'm just on this, this train car, I'm landing at this point, you know, I'm, you know, this is the person I'm looking at, I'm feeling a little bit strange. You know, already you've taken a, a, a different sort of um, approach to your defense. You're calling in reinforcements, um, which I think could be very powerful. We're not really talking about that too much um, with respect to, to showing yeah, but up. But and... again, with Michael's example, you've got some guy coming at you exactly. with a knife. You're not going to pull out your phone. So if reasonableness is essentially the only threshold for a judge or jury to consider, and you get a person like this involved in deciding your fate, you're going to have a bad time. This person isn't reasonable, she's delusional. But the justice system has no good way of filtering out delusional, do-gooder pacifists like this from having decision over your fate. But for someone like this, violence is never the answer. And they will use clauses like B and C to always punish people for using defensive violence as readily and equally as any criminal or thug using offensive violence. The vagueness of these laws aside, the way they're designed and the things that they consider is still based on the flaws of the older broken model. One of the main problems I have with the current self-defense laws is that when we're put into a situation where we need to use them, we still become responsible for both our safety and the safety of our attacker. Whereas the offender bears essentially no legal responsibility for our safety or even their own safety. As the victim in this situation, we bear all of the criminal liability and risk for both parties despite having done nothing to contribute to the situation. For example, when we are attacked, there are multiple clauses in Section 34 which require us to use no more force than reasonably possible. This is also essentially the same thing as saying that we must be as gentle as possible with our assailants. Which is ridiculous in my opinion. Subsection E says that we must consider their size, age, and gender and physical capabilities in determining how we react. So if an attacker is smaller in stature, we are required, by law, to use less force on them if we can. I should not be responsible for considering their fragility before I react. My assailant should be responsible to consider their own fragility before they attack me. That's, that's their job, that's not mine. I should not be held legally, morally, or physically responsible for their poor decision making. So it appears that the ideal outcome for a self-defense encounter, according to our self-defense laws, would be that nobody gets hurt. However, in legally requiring victims to use restraint, they are exposing these victims to an unnecessary and increased level of risk as they are now responsible for more than just their own safety in a situation where their own safety should be their one and only concern. And this is because our self-defense laws are built on a similar practical and moral framework to police use of force continuums. In this document from the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary, they have this to say about use of force. Police use of force is designed to gain control of a subject using no more force than is reasonably necessary, having regard firstly to officer safety and secondly to minimizing harm to the subject. While the continuum itself is not exactly analogous to self-defense laws, the underlying intent appears to be the same. Our current self-defense laws do permit you to make your own safety your primary concern, but you're also required to minimize harm to your attacker if you are able, which is nonsense in my opinion. The self-defense factors in Canadian law are based around the concept of matching force with force, much like a police use of force continuum is. Reasonableness is largely based on proportionality, and proportionality is largely based on the idea of a fair fight. For example, if I was at a sports bar and some random drunk guy came up to me unprovoked with his fists up, trying to fight me, it would be well within the law for me to engage in an honorable bout of fisticuffs with the good gentleman. However, if I saw him coming and decided to pick up a steak knife off the table and fatally stab the jerk in the neck instead of fighting him with my bare hands, it would be highly unlikely that the law or the courts would consider that to be a proportionate response even though I was clearly only trying to defend myself. And a lot of people would consider that to be a severe overreaction. And maybe it is. But if it is, then in effect the law is saying that in such a situation, I am required, by law, to give him the opportunity to punch me in the head. Maybe even to concuss me. Maybe he knocks me out. Maybe I never wake up at all. All it takes is one bad fall. 
And these are problems that the law acknowledges, and it does specifically consider the size and physical capabilities of attackers for this reason, but those injuries can be very easily inflicted by smaller individuals as well. And additionally, an unarmed person is only unarmed until they are not. You have no way of knowing what an assailant has concealed on their person until it's too late to do anything about it. So these are certainly good considerations for police officers to make when determining how much force they can use on someone, but they are ill-suited for violent encounters between civilians. And not only because police have significantly more training, backup, legal authority, and a much larger variety of tools and weapons on hand, but primarily because police officers signed up for it. In a sense, they are consenting to the inevitability that being a cop will put them into harm's way at some point. So both due to that pseudo-consent and owing to their status as an officer of the law, it's not unreasonable to suggest they do actually bear some measure of responsibility for the safety of aggressors involved in a situation. However, since civilians do not qualify for these reasons, civilians should not be required to bear the same cross. It is a cop's job to protect members of the public, and that generally includes the criminals they are actively trying to stop, but it is not my job to protect the public. It is only my job to protect myself and my loved ones. And as such, there should be no legal responsibility, implied or otherwise, for me to protect my assailant in any fashion. This interpretation is also consistent with the stated purpose of criminal law from our federal Crown Prosecutors. They say the protection of the public cannot be left to the individual, but is instead the responsibility of the community and, in a larger sense, the state. My assailant is a member of the public, and criminal law is not supposed to make individuals like myself responsible for the protection of the public. That is the role of the state, or more specific to our discussion, police officers. Being that our jobs and roles are different, the rules pertaining to officers and civilians for self-defense and defense of property should be significantly different as well. However, the current extent of our self-defense laws would say otherwise. They make individuals responsible for the protection of criminals who themselves are members of the public, meaning that the self-defense laws directly contradict the stated purpose of criminal law. So what changes should we make in order to bring this definition into alignment with the intent and stated purpose of criminal law at large? Well, first things first, I think the whole section needs to be rewritten so the boundaries are more obvious and clear. I can certainly understand the value in having significant flexibility in the interpretation of the law, but as the definition stands now, it doesn't actually tell you what's allowed and what is not. It merely tells you what factors will be considered. It does not tell you where the limits of your actions are. Whether or not you can use force to defend yourself is sort of based on your own reasonability, but how much force you can use is based on the court's reasonability. All of this makes the regulations too vague and also inconsistent. Whether or not you're innocent relies too heavily on the individual morality of that particular judge or jury rather than on any kind of objective and understandable criteria. The current structure of the self-defense regulations force victims between a rock and a hard place. Slightly overreact and you could end up in prison. Slightly underreact and you could end up in the morgue. Not only that, but you're already at a disadvantage in these situations because the bad guy always gets to go first. If you're lucky, you may only have seconds to respond. If you delay your response in any way, you may never get the opportunity to defend yourself at all. If you have to wait until you're in immediate peril before you're permitted to react, then it's likely already too late. But if you act before you're in immediate peril, then you risk prison. On top of all of these disadvantages, you have to make all of these split-second decisions while you're in a fight-or-flight state of mind. When your body is coursing with extreme levels of adrenaline and cortisol, calm and rational thinking is largely compromised. Innocent victims should never be put into such a delicate balancing act. Now, to be fair, the court does generally consider these things, and it does generally give the victims some small degree of latitude to justify their actions. But there are also times they get it wrong since the laws are so open-ended and open to such wide interpretations. To fix this, I think subsections B, C, D, and E need to change. B essentially requires the victim to de-escalate if they can. C is overtly a responsibility clause, which places potentially extreme criminal liability onto victims if they do not react correctly to a non-objective standard in the heat of the moment during a high-stress situation. D needs to be removed because disarmed people are not undangerous. Severe bodily harm and death can easily result from disarmed people. And this should not be a consideration beyond a simple proportionality analysis, as is required in Section G. E, much like C and D, makes victims legally liable for the safety of their assailant, which is nonsense. 
The law should not require victims to be gentle with their assailants. Our physical discrepancies should be the legal responsibility of my assailant. For example, if my assailant is much larger and stronger than me, do you suppose he'd also be gentle with me? I mean, in all likelihood, our physical differences is why he's attacking me in the first place. Violent and dangerous criminals aren't looking to engage in a fair fight, nor are they required to. And as such, there should be no legal requirement for me to engage in a fair fight to defend myself. Self-defense isn't supposed to be about fairness, it's about justice. It should exist for the protection of the innocent. And if criminals want to be protected from victims, all they need to do is stay home and not be criminals. It's not that complicated. With these faults in mind, I think the changes we need should look something more like this. B should be rewarded. Like the first portion's fine, but the second portion should be discarded. If I'm in danger from an attacker, I should be permitted to use whatever means I deem necessary to protect myself. If those means are disproportionate to the threat, that should be considered under Section G, but the law should not require me to risk my safety to protect my assailant in any way. This also means that C would need to be replaced. This rule, or rather its blatant misinterpretation by the courts, is the thing that has an otherwise innocent man, Peter Cahill, rotting in prison right now. Instead of debating the victim's contribution to the incident, which, which is apparently what the Supreme Court wants, to victim blame those who had the audacity to actually attempt to use their Section 34 or Section 35 protections, victims operating in a defensive or reactionary capacity should be given significant deference for their actions. We should change the law to determining who is the aggressor in the situation. Now, the word transgressor might be more appropriate as this section of definitions also covers property offenses. A trespasser or vandal is still the aggressor or transgressor in a situation even if he's not actively being violent towards any particular individual until confrontation ensues. Since at the end of the day, they're still the ones who set these chains of events into motion. If two parties have a long history of disputes, that can still be considered under section F, but it should not be necessarily determinative of who started it or who was acting as the aggressor or transgressor in any particular encounter. Sections D and E are redundant. They should be removed and replaced. They're essentially just a proportionality clause, which is already considered under section G. What isn't anywhere on this list of factors, but definitely should be, is a consideration for defense in an area which is either public or private. And I don't necessarily mean public or private property, I mean areas which are easily accessible or inaccessible to the public. For example, your front yard is private property, but it's still a publicly accessible space. A stranger standing on your front lawn may be a concern, but if that same stranger ends up in your living room at 3 in the morning, he is now a threat. Also, if threats should appear in your vicinity in a public space, you may have more options of evasion or withdrawal open to you if you choose to use them, but most of the time in a private area, such options are just not practical if they're even available at all. We should also add a clause for warnings. Whether there was time for a warning, whether a warning was issued, and whether the transgressor was given sufficient time to withdraw from the warning if time was available. For example, if I confront somebody in my home in the middle of the night and say, get out of my house or I'll shoot, and if he clearly hears me and sees me and understands me, but chooses not to get out of my house, I mean, <laughs> at that point, whatever happens next really shouldn't be considered a war crime, regardless of the level of threat he actually poses in that particular moment. But if he does heed the warning and he's actively trying to leave, and I shoot him in the back anyway simply because I could, I mean, that would obviously be much more difficult to justify. So I think these changes would be a good place to start. However, we still have the issue that these clauses are very non-specific. Most of self-defense legality is found in precedent and case law rather than in statute. And this makes the law too vague, which is a legitimate constitutional issue. We could fix this by using the empty clauses which were repealed in 2012 by Harper to expressly declare certain combination of factors to be inherently lawful or unlawful. Although we'd want to be kind of particular about it because we're not just trying to revert to the pre-2012 laws either. For example, introducing true castle laws have been talked about a lot in recent months in Canada. And I've already talked a little bit about the common law history of castle doctrine in Canada, but I think it's also fair to say that the current regime doesn't go far enough for most people's liking. And it's not clear where the lines are since it's not actually written down anywhere in the section regarding self-defense. We could make a statute saying that if the private area clause explained in section D is their private residence or dwelling, and the homeowner is not acting as the transgressor as explained in section C, that any intruder or assailant is automatically declared as the transgressor 
and the proportionality standard in section G could be changed to a standard of gross disproportionality, thereby giving the homeowner significantly more leeway in the means used to protect the property or residents within it. Now, I'm not advocating for blank protections here. Like, if someone's behaving even slightly provocatively, that shouldn't be met with Armageddon. With these changes, there would still be some measure of onus for people not to react in a ridiculously excessive fashion, but anything short of that would be justified within the home. And perhaps we could even extend this to its immediate surroundings, such as a garage, a shed, or a vehicle, as those are also private areas which the public does not have lawful access to. We should also have a better and clearer definition for proportionality. Since proportionality and reasonability are so closely linked, their definitions are rather similar as well. I think proportionality can be best described by alternatives. For any response to be considered disproportionate, it must mean that there was some other viable alternative action which could have been reasonably pursued instead of the action that was taken. As a part of any guilty ruling handed down where a defendant claims self-defense but was not acquitted by the courts, the judge or jury should be made to clearly articulate what reasonable alternative should have been used by the defendant. This reasonable response must not include relying on the police, as police response times nationwide are realistically much too high for them to be relied upon for any kind of preventative or protective measures. And we saw this in action just recently regarding an incident in Mississauga. An armed home invasion in Mississauga has left one dead and two others injured. CB24's crime analyst Steve Ryan is on the scene. So please tell us that uh, just before uh, 4 o'clock this morning, three unknown suspects forced their way into that home. That would make this a home invasion by definition. And there was an altercation uh, between two groups of people. One man uh, sustained life threatening injuries and died uh, as a result of his injuries and two other adults in that home um, were injured. I have been told as well, Jamie, is that uh, the homeowners of this house have just recently put in those large gates out front of the driveway and they've installed security cameras as well. So that may be of some interest uh, to the investigators. And this is another reminder that security cameras aren't security, they're merely surveillance. Surveillance may help police catch criminals after the fact and therefore they are an effective deterrent, but this just shows us again that deterrence aren't protection, and neither is the police. So just being expected to call the police to ensure your protection is not a viable option in any real sense. And even if it was, the protections laid out for us in section 34 and section 35 make no specific mention of needing to call the police, and nor should they. Self-defense is the very idea that you're not required to leave your protection up to the police. So even if we set the issue of effectiveness aside, a requirement to call the police would be fundamentally contrary to the purpose of the existence of these sections to begin with. The reasonable alternative must also not include abdicating your actual legal protections under section 34 or section 35. For example, if the judge says that lethal force is a disproportionate use of force, then that should have to mean that you could have protected yourself or your property by some other lesser force in some other reasonable way, and not that you should have simply avoided the criminal or allowed him to damage or steal your property in order to protect the criminal. We saw this in the conviction of Peter Cahill last year, who was now serving eight years for manslaughter, although apparently the judge made a mistake and it was only supposed to be six years. And no, I'm not making that up. So, that's fun. He was initially found not guilty, but on appeal from the Crown, and after a mistrial, he was finally convicted on his third trial because the third jury finally had 12 people on it who supposedly were able to correctly consider his role in the incident. And to be clear, the shooting itself was justified. Actually killing his intruder wasn't why he went to jail. A jury of his peers found that Cahill had sufficient reason to believe that his life was in danger. The appeal to the Supreme Court didn't even question that finding, and neither did the Supreme Court itself. What they actually questioned was his role in the incident under section 34 to subsection C. The Supreme Court said he could have done other things like call 911, or to call out to the intruder from the window, or to turn on the lights in order to avoid a fatal confrontation. And fair enough, in theory he could have done all that. But do you remember how this video started? What the police recommended you do when criminals come to steal your car? Leave your fobs at your front door. Because so they're breaking into your home to steal your car. A lot of them that they're arresting have guns on them. And they're not toy guns, they're real guns. They're loaded. So the cops say that confronting them could get you shot. And the Supreme Court literally recommends that you make yourself as loud and as visible as possible to these people if you want to be able to protect yourself from them. Which is, which is utterly asinine. This further supports my notion that the 
Court's idea of proportionality includes the concept of a fair fight. Like, it wasn't wrong for Cahill to shoot the intruder. The Supreme Court issue was that Cahill had the element of surprise on his side. And not only that, but this decision actually goes against existing precedent on the matter, according to Runkle of the Bailey. Now, in terms of, you know, he could have called 911. 911 is great if you've got 15 to 30 minutes or longer. I'm not sure that, you know, just call 911 is such a great response here, um, especially because the law does allow for some ability to protect your property. You're not allowed to use lethal force for the protection of property, but you can protect yourself as you go to investigate something, or at least that's what the, uh, that's what case law had found in the past. So the judge indicates it was indeed Peter who failed to avoid the final fatal confrontation. And again, it's up until the moment of the shooting, um, it seems to me that we we're talking about somebody who was behaving lawfully. Um, I think that there is a potential at least, um, or at least that this case may have undermined um, self-defense and defense of property in Canada. Notwithstanding that it's a jury verdict, and therefore the verdict itself doesn't have a whole lot of precedential effect, uh, the, the way the, this is going to change jury instructions uh, ends up meaning that self-defense and defense of property become a little more difficult in Canada. Absolute travesty of justice as far as I'm concerned. So at the end of the day, they found him guilty of manslaughter because he didn't call the police and because he armed himself and went forward to confront his intruder under the cover of darkness. But had he stayed inside and simply called the police, it's possible, if not likely, that the criminal could have easily stolen his truck, the knife inside it, or anything else and easily left in the time it would have taken the police to arrive and stop the guy. Yet if Cahill went outside unarmed and confronted the intruder, either to make a citizen's arrest or to just wrestle the guy off of his property, he very likely could have been stabbed since the criminal in his truck had potential access to a knife at the time he was shot, let alone any other potential arms Cahill couldn't have known about until after the fact. So the court eventually found his actions to be wrong, but the only correct thing they would have let him do would have been to either sacrifice his Section 34 or Section 35 protections. So if the only lesser lawful response was to force him to either lose his property or to risk his personal safety, then whatever actions he did take, even if they seem extreme, couldn't possibly have been disproportionate in my view, since they did actually constitute the minimum force necessary to guarantee his Section 34 and Section 35 protections. The law should understand and reflect this, Another common problem with self-defense in Canada is regarding the criminal proceedings for self-defense claims. We saw this happen in Milton, Ontario earlier this year. Ali Mian did nothing wrong. Several armed intruders broke into his house, tied up his mother, and threw her in the bathtub. He defended her legally and in accordance with the law with his lawfully acquired firearm. He was still charged with second degree murder, spent weeks in jail, and then had to pay a significantly massive bail of over a hundred thousand dollars, not to mention whatever his non-refundable legal fees were, had his firearms confiscated and his firearms license confiscated and suspended and so on. Even though all of the available evidence clearly supported his claim to self-defense. Only after six long months of the police and courts desperately trying in vain to find something to stick, they finally dropped the charges and backed off. Now, a lot of people consider this to be kind of like a victory for self-defense owners, since he was eventually found not guilty, but it's, it's nothing of the sort in my opinion. From my view, some guy woke up in the middle of the night, found multiple armed men in his house attacking his mother, he protected her, and then the government tried rather hard to destroy his life for it for some insane reason. Even though the charges were eventually dropped, it upended his life rather significantly and put him through unnecessary and severe emotional and financial stress. That's just not fair or reasonable, no matter which way you slice it. The police and the court should never be in a position where it is their duty to prosecute the clearly innocent. In instances where the preliminary evidence would clearly indicate the validity of a self-defense claim, charges should not be laid until there is also strong evidence to bring these self-defense claims into question. Weird as that may sound, that's not exactly an unusual circumstance. It's already the case for federal charges in several provinces across Canada, apparently according to our federal crown prosecutors. This should become the standard practice for self-defense use of force at a national level. We could also implement other considerations towards the laying of charges, even when the claim relates to self-defense. For example, if perhaps there were additional related charges or a previous history of violence which could make the entire incident suspect. But that brings me to the end of my suggestions. Uh, do I honestly think any of these changes or reforms will ever happen in Canada? Of course not. But I think it'd be cool if they did, you know? The law must be designed to protect and support the law-abiding, but our current defense laws are designed largely to protect criminals at the expense of the victims, and give victims far too narrow of an avenue of viable options to protect themselves with. 
While these revisions are not entirely without issue, of course, I do think ideas like these would be a step in the right direction, and it would cause self-defense to better align with the supposed goals of criminal law in Canada. The Supreme Court of Canada says that criminal laws are about promoting justice, peace, and safety. Which, I mean, that sounds pretty good, and I think most Canadians should be interested in that. But most people, including even the Supreme Court apparently, don't really understand what these terms mean. Peace is nonviolence, but as I've kind of showed you in this video, safety requires violence. Even police officers must use violence to keep people safe. So if peace requires nonviolence, and safety requires violence, then, as weird as it sounds, they are actually opposing values. Safety and peace are on opposite ends of the same spectrum. If you want to be peaceful, you can't be completely safe. And if you want to be safe, you can't be completely peaceful. Justice, at least in this context, is found in correctly balancing the two. Over the last few decades, Canadians, along with many other Western societies, have adopted a misguided belief that all violence is evil and that the only way to be safe is to be peaceful. Of course, the obvious problem with this is that not all people want to be peaceful. And this turns the peaceful into targets. Most Western societies, rather than understanding this flaw with their reasoning and addressing it, have instead decided to entirely restructure society so that people are harmless and therefore incapable of anything other than peace. This is even the root of where all of our gun control laws come from. This is also where our broken self-defense laws come from. In some ways, this even extends to much of the misguided woke style rhetoric and ideology. The pursuit of absolute peace is not a bad goal exactly, it's simply unattainable in a free society. The rationale is basically that if we can't get everyone to buy into peace, then at least we can make them harmless and that's essentially the same thing. But therein lies the problem. Harmlessness isn't peace, it's pacifism. But enforced harmlessness isn't pacifism, it's pacification. Enforced harmlessness is what we do to prisoners. Prisons pacify prisoners. That's their primary function. All of the restrictions on freedom that prisoners face are born solely out of a desire to reduce the danger and harm that prisoners pose to themselves or others and to the rest of society. Prison is the end result of what happens when you play out an ethos of enforced harmlessness in the name of peace. And it's rather evident that prisoners do not live in a free society. Therefore, peace and freedom are also opposing values. So long as people are free, they are also free to choose to do harm. Therefore, the only way to prevent people from doing any harm is to completely remove their freedom. And we see this playing out in practice in our society with the hyperfixation on public safety these days. This does not align with the purpose of criminal law, which says it exists only to punish bad behavior. It should not exist to prohibit freedom itself. The pursuit of absolute peace requires the abolition of a free society which is exactly where our society is headed under the guise of liberal compassion and governance. But what is the conservative answer? Well, Stephen Harper tweaked our self-defense laws in 2012, it's not enough to get us to where we need to be. Pierre Polyev has promised to fix the crime problem on a great many occasions by giving repeat violent offenders jail and not bail, and I think he'll likely do so. But of course, no matter how effective that might be, it won't mean a 100% reduction in crime or anything like that, which means we will still have sacrificial lambs and we will still need to consider expanding our self-defense laws if he truly wants to keep Canadians safe. And while I'm not aware of any commentary he has made specifically on self-defense, he has promised to replace woke culture with a warrior culture. I will replace the woke culture with a warrior culture. Now, he said all of that in the context of military spending and ailing recruitment numbers, but that promise could have significant civilian connotations as well. Will he adjust the self-defense laws to allow warriors to do what warriors do? Honestly? Probably not. But it's also not fair to condemn him or his actions until he's in a position with the power to actually implement such reforms. There has also been a lot of talk in our firearm community about changing the authorization to carry laws in Canada to make them far more accessible to everyday folk to protect themselves even outside of their homes. While I would heavily support expanding the permissions for authorization to carry so that normal civilians can get these permits, I honestly can't see any politician signing off on such a polarizing topic. It would likely result in career suicide. But I'll discuss my specific thoughts on that in more detail in another video at some point in the future. So I'd like to thank you all for watching. What do you think? Do you think our self-defense laws need enhancements or are they fine the way they are? And do you agree with my suggested changes to the law or do you have better suggestions that we should consider instead? 
And are you in favor of firearm carry permits for civilians? Let me know in the comment sections down below. And all that being said, I'd like to thank you all for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.